Hello there, good evening. Welcome to the Transfer Show as Mesut Ozil's future at Arsenal is thrown into question after interest from Fenerbahce. Yeah, we'll also have news on Romelu Lukaku and Paul Pogba's agent has been speaking out again. Uh, plus, there's another twist in West Ham's pursuit of a striker and PSG's row with Neymar escalates. But we start with Mesut Ozil. Hello there, welcome along. Uh, Rob Dorsen also with us. We'll come to him shortly, but we do start with that big news uh, concerning Arsenal and it involves Mesut Ozil. Cave, we, we did think that his wages, his long-term contract might mean that Arsenal maybe couldn't get rid of him, but there's interest. Uh, yes, Fenerbahce are looking into the possibility of signing uh, Mesut Ozil from Arsenal. Uh, he has two years left on his contract at Arsenal and he's the highest earner uh, at Arsenal. Fenerbahce, I don't think, could really afford to buy him outright. What they're looking for is a loan deal whereby Arsenal would continue to pay a percentage of his wages. Fenerbahce at the moment are a sort of at the start of a rebuilding project. They finished only sixth in the uh, Turkish first division uh, last season. It would make sense for Arsenal to try and lower their wage bill because, of course, uh, Mesut Ozil is set to earn £350,000 a week. Now, I don't think there's any way Fenerbahce could uh, afford that, but if there was a way they could come to some sort of agreement with Arsenal where Arsenal would carry on paying some of those wages, then it could happen. I think we're still at the stage where talks have not taken place between the clubs. Uh, this is something that intermediaries are working on. But I would have to say, if it was to happen, it would possibly be the biggest transfer in the history of Turkish football. Uh, but at the moment, no talks between the clubs. Uh, just picking up on something Carve said there about it being the biggest transfer and, and Mesut Ozil's contract and his wages, it just is worth noting that Arsenal's much-publicised limited transfer budget is likely they'll have to sell players if they're to fund any big moves. It's difficult to see them agreeing to a deal like the one Carve's just been explaining. Yes, they would have some of Ozil's wages taken off the payroll, but would it be enough for them to buy the likes of, dare I say it, Crystal Palace forward Wilfred Zaha? But there is another side to this, because Ozil has entered the final two years of his contract, as Carve was saying. And the Arsenal hierarchy have publicly said that they will look to sell players in the final two years unless they sign a new deal. Now, as it stands, there's been nothing to suggest so far that Arsenal are going to offer Mesut Ozil a new contract. So perhaps a decision on Ozil's future needs to be made sooner rather than later. There is other news to bring you concerning Arsenal on the side of Ozil, and it's to do with the Saint-Étienne defender... Uh, William Saliba. Talks are continuing between the two clubs about a potential transfer, but the French club's president says that it's the will of the player that he spends next season at Saint-Étienne. Hence, that's why we've been reporting Arsenal may look to do a deal whereby they buy Saliba now and then loan him back to Saint-Étienne. And with that in mind, it wouldn't affect this year's transfer budget too much for Arsenal. It does sound like there are several hurdles to get over before anything happens with Ozil, most of it financial. Uh, Rob, Arsenal have managed to fill one position today. What's the news on that? Yeah, not a player. This is somebody who, though, may well bring players in. Um, we told you back in January that um, we expected Edu, uh, former member of the Invincibles, of course, to come back as technical director at the Emirates. That's been confirmed today. Um, and he performed, performed a similar role with Corinthians before moving to the Brazilian FA. Um, and they actually won the Copper America for the first time in 12 years at the weekend. So he, he comes off the back of that success. And it, it's a good fit, really, because Edu played under Uno, Uno Emery at, at Valencia. And I think you've got to look at the wider restructuring of Arsenal, which these boys have talked about incessantly since Arsene Wenger's departure. He wanted complete control over transfer policy. Um, after Arsene Wenger left, Arsenal have, have completely developed their structure, um, which allows for Edu to become the first ever technical director at the club. So we'll see how it beds down. Um, he's got a good knowledge of players in the game. Um, and listen to what Arsenal said when they announced this, actually. I think this is interesting. Edu will coordinate the work of our first team coaching group, the academy, and player scouting and recruitment in order to oversee the constant building up and efficient strengthening of our squad. Look at that current Arsenal squad. There's only Ainsley Maitland-Niles that has come through the academy of all of their first-team players. It's Edu's job to make sure that changes. And 
Sven Mislintat came and went. Yeah. Borussia Dortmund. He's now gone. Raul Sanlehi remains. So will Edu take over the player recruitment role? as part of, of his larger brief? That, well, that's as we understand it. I mean, when you get these roles of technical director and sporting director, they can mean very different things at different clubs. But that's as we understand Edu's role is going to be at Arsenal. And they spelt it out pretty clearly there. It's overseeing the, all of the coaching, all of the recruitment, and making sure that young players come through that, uh, that, co that academy setup. Compare it with Chelsea. Chelsea have got more than 40 players out on loan last season, most of them through their academy. Arsenal just haven't brought that number of players through. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and, and, and of course, they have a manager in Una I Emery, who is used to this structure, he's, he's managed at European clubs at Sevilla. He had was it Monchi, one yeah. of the, the best sporting directors yeah. that you can get. So he's used to that structure being in place at a football club, whereby he can concentrate on the coaching. He can give player targets to to someone to sort out, and then that's it. That we get them to sort it out. They can come back to him and say, yeah, we've signed him, we can't get him. And then he works with whatever he is given. OK, well, we'll keep an eye on that. And we've also been keeping an eye on Manchester United today, of course. Uh, developments over the future uh, of Romelu Lukaku. We'll also come to Paul Pogba, of course. But, Kave, what do you know? Yes, regarding Romelu Lukaku, Inter Milan officials are due in England this week for talks about Lukaku. Now, what do we know about Lukaku? We know that he wants to move to Inter Milan. We also understand that Manchester United are willing to sell him if possible, but he does respect Manchester United and he's not going to disrespect them. What is interesting with Romelu Lukaku, if you contrast it with Paul Pogba, <laughs> is that Romelu Lukaku used to have as his agent Mina Raiola, uh, the man who is, of course, Paul Pogba's agent, but he has switched agents. He has a new agent. That is why we're seeing the different kind of approaches when it comes to Pogba wanting to leave Manchester United and Lukaku wanting to leave Manchester United. And, and Carve mentions Mina Raiola there, and he's been speaking as is his way about Paul Pogba today. And that's amid this huge uncertainty over Pogba's Manchester United future. Remember, Pogba spoke about his desire for a new challenge. That was last month when he was on that promotional tour in Tokyo. And Raiola told Jim White on Talk Sport this morning the following quote. The player has done nothing wrong. He has been respectful and professional in every way. The club has known his feeling for a long time. It's a shame other people only want to criticise without the right information. And I'm also sorry that the club does not take any position against this. Hopefully, this is quite significant, there will be a soon a satisfying solution for all parties. That begs the question, what is a satisfying solution for all parties? Publicly, United's stance has not changed. Pogba is not for sale and he's part of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's plans. They have to say that. They want to protect the asset. They want to get as much for him if they are to sell him. What's more, Pogba is with the squad on their pre-season tour. However, if he is to go, what would United want? They would want the current market value. They bought him for £90 million. They're probably going to want in the current market value a lot more than that. So, but they will want this sorted one way or another long before the deadline. That's because they will want to bring in replacements. If they get all this money in, they'll want to spend it to replace Paul Pogba. But if they are left in limbo when deadline day arrives, it leaves Manchester United very exposed to the likes of Juventus and Real Madrid because the window in Italy, where Juventus are obviously... That closes on August the 23rd, 15 days after the one in England. And significantly in Spain, it closes on September the 2nd. So you've got close to four weeks after the window closes here for Spanish clubs to still buy players. It should be noted that United were actually one of five Premier League clubs who voted against the early closure of the window, perhaps for situations exactly like this mm. one. Yeah, there'll be uh, a nervous wait for them. It just... To quickly pick up on, on the comments from Raiola, he says, nothing wrong, the player's done nothing wrong, respectful and professional every way. Many of Manchester United fans would probably disagree with that, would they not? Because he said that he was ready for a new challenge just a short time ago. Yes, I mean, he's being honest. So, if, if he wants to put it out in, in that way, I mean, if he was getting advice, probably... It wasn't the, the smartest move in the world. It wasn't on a Manchester United event. It was on a promotional event where he was um, on his own, where, where he decided, right, someone's asked me the question, so I'm going to answer the question. And instead of... He could have said, I'm not going to make any comment, which would have gained probably as much traction as this. He's probably just said, look, 
I'm being honest. And then his agent as well, Mina Raiola, he's, he's not a shy and retired type, as I've said before. <laughs> he, he knows that the game works. He made his comments as well, and now he's followed them up with these comments too. It will be interesting to see how those two situations, Lukaku and, and Pogba, play out. Um, they do need midfielders, though, Darmesh. They've, they've had a couple of midfielders leave, uh, and they've made inquiries about another one. Yeah, um, and Herrera. Gone, PSG now, he's uh, on a free transfer. Marwan Fellaini went to China back in January. Now, we told you about the interest in Newcastle United, Sean Longstaff. We're expecting Manchester United to make a bid. They haven't yet. They're also very keen, as we've been reporting on Sporting Lisbon's Bruno Fernandes, but that deal is a real complex one because there's so many issues connected with his contract and his release clause. But the latest player, perhaps a surprising one, that United have made an inquiry about is Southampton's Mario Lamina. Now, he joined Southampton two seasons ago for £18 million and has now been given permission to speak to other clubs. He wasn't included in their pre-season training camp in Austria, so he doesn't figure, it seems, in the future plans of Ralph Hasenhutl. Yeah, so not wanted at Southampton, but possibly wanted at Manchester United. That, that's a conundrum, isn't it? And another conundrum, well, perhaps less of a conundrum now that, that Yuri Tillemans has gone to Leicester. But, Rob, we understand there was a possible other destination for him. Yeah, now look, I don't want to overplay this, but so I've been talking to sources about this right throughout the whole deal, and a few more details have come my way since Tielemann signed that four-year contract yesterday. Uh, first and foremost, and this is a big piece of, of news, actually, which I think will, will interest a, a lot of people, I've had it told, explained to me categorically today, it wasn't £40 million, pounds, I thought, that the price for Yuri Tielemann's, which we thought it was. It was an even better deal for less than that, £35 million, pounds, and we think there is no buyout clause in there as well. So you think about that from a Leicester perspective, that's a heck of a deal to pull off it, it, with the performances Tielemans put in last season and, and the likes of, of clubs that were interested in him, we were told, are from around Europe. Many of them, no disrespect to Leicester, but much bigger than Leicester City. But this other piece of information has come through to me today. I understand Tielemans agent was very keen to wait and not s sign a deal with Leicester City and tie Tielemans down to that because, in particular, he was looking at what we've just been talking about, Paul Pogba at Manchester United. He thought, and he'd, there were, he'd had information to this, to this end, I'm told, that if Pogba left Manchester United, Manchester United may well be interested in possibly taking Yuri Tielemans to Manchester United. But it was Tielemans who said, no, I'm not interested in going to Manchester United. Even if they come in for me later in this window, I want to sign for Leicester City now. He's been talking to Brendan Rodgers at the end of last season and throughout the summer as well. He's bought into the ambitions of Brendan Rodgers to break through into that top six. And he feels at home there. So he said, I'm not interested in waiting around to see if Manchester United come calling. I want to sign for Leicester now and at a cut price, £35 million. And I just wonder, when some of the big clubs in the Premier League and elsewhere see that Tillemans went for £35 million, whether they think, do you know what, we really missed a trick there. We really did. What a window for Leicester, by the way. Yeah. Iosi Perez, 30 million quid. James Justin. I, I and now Yuri would encourage if, if someone like Yuri Tielemans is saying what we think he's saying, Manchester United's not for me, I want to go to Leicester City, what would that do for other players who, who want to, who are thinking about making a decision between certain clubs? And Brendan Rodgers has been the, the main person behind this, hasn't he? To yeah. tell yeah. Tielemans, look, this is, this is where you belong, this is where the ambition is. So not only Tielemans joining, Perez joining, there'll be other players who might be queuing up now to join, and then it adds extra spice to what Harry Maguire might do. I was do. just about to say exactly that. And think, think of two things here. Think, think of what's Harry Maguire making of this. Does it make it much more likely that he's going to stay? I think actually that's irrelevant, because unless Leicester get the £80 million plus bid, it's not an issue. But if that bid does come in, does this change Harry Maguire's mind? Does he think, you know, I might want to stay there? If his only other destination is potentially Old Trafford, where I, I know there are concerns amongst his, his team that is it the right time for him to be going to Manchester United? What message does that say? But also Paul Pogba. If United, we were just talking about, if Paul Pogba leaves Manchester United, what, what message does that give to players who would be coming to Old Trafford? Is that a, a warning to them that the big stars don't want to stay there? And it also shows... 35 million for Tillemans, 20 something for Andre Gomez at, at, uh, at Everton. It just shows that players, good, good quality players, quality midfielders are available and you don't have to pay 60 or 70 million pounds to get them.